Um, I am currently the acting director of the Science Studies Program at a, a small liberal arts university on the east coast of Canada, but actually, wow. as of next week, I'll be a University of Ottawa faculty member in sociology and anthropology. Mm -hmm. So I'm in between jobs right now and moving to Ottawa next week. So that's why I put both uh, email addresses up there if you wanted to use my current address for questions and feedback. And I'm hoping, I'm presenting today in the spirit of, I'm really hoping I'm that there are more people. I, it's an early stage research project, and I'm really hoping for to crowdsource ideas on method and um, some of my preliminary analysis. I'm hoping for feedback. I wanted to begin with a story. Early morning light reflects off the all white cladding on an ultra modern house. Displayed inside the front door of this house are figurines of John Deere tractors from a bygone era. The tractors were mechanical, no authorizing software, no USB port. Cut to a fridge that, unlike these old tractors, digitally communicates, in this instance, with a smart coffee maker that begins to brew just now, at precisely 6 a.m. The farmer who lives in this house arrives in the kitchen to, in time to receive his coffee. He stands at a computer projected onto the kitchen wall, kind of a la minority report. Its contents uh, protected by a fingerprint scanner that recognizes Terry and opens to him a wealth of visual informatics. Terry swipes to a screen displaying weather data that's being collected by his John Deere equipment and advising him today is the day to irrigate. An intelligent personal assistant, that sounds oddly like Siri, warns Terry of an impending storm set to hit field number 511 where his son is riding a GPS lead tractor. Now this vision doesn't come from me, in fact, um, but it's, uh, it's John Deere's. So this is actually, um, this is basically a textual description, my own, or so I, so I guess suppose it's an interpretation, but I don't we'll see how far off it is from the actual, um, from this John Deere advertisement for our campaign, really, a kind of promissory campaign. This is what John Deere imagines is the future of farming. That's the aptly titled Farm Forward. This is from 2016. You can find this if you can just YouTube it. Um, the images here support the advertisement's textual message, I think, Farm Forward that implies John Deere's tools for collecting and analyzing big volumes of data will extend the North American farm in two ways, as I imagine it, or I see it. One, ensuring its survival by, in John Deere's own words, dramatically enhancing productivity and farming efficiency, but also, two, by bringing the, the farm into the modern era, right, uh, into the digital era. John Deere is not alone in this vision for farming. Um, Climate Corporation, for example, now owned by Monsanto Corporation, design, they design tools for the collection and analysis of large volumes of weather data. They go as far, their CEO went as far as to predict a, an entirely data-driven farm of the future. Today I want to discuss an early stage research project that begins from an interrogation of the assumptions behind these visions for data-driven farming. And the assumptions as I see them are two assumptions, and they're related. Um, the first assumption is that data necessarily optimize human decision making. Um, and the, uh, as a corollary, the second assumption is, is that data are, you know, that, that data driven farming is optimized because data are raw. They're unmediated, right? They're, they're, not, um, they're not faulty, they're not um, weak like human, the human brain, for example. So this is the cover of, this is from a, a title article in New Science. Um, New Scientist article from December of 2016. So the article was about you know how mining large volumes of data is so much better than fallible human, human decision making because of the weaknesses of the human brain toward bias and that kind of thing. So in the research that I want to talk about today, or at least part of this research project, um, the the team that that um, is moving this research forward really begins by seeing data um, in the language of Gittleman and Jackson of um, uh, MIT Press book, the whole name I can't remember now, but I'll find the source if you're interested. They see that data, um, they say, harbor the interpretive structures of their own meaning. So that's the perspective that we take. And another way of saying that is, rather than the dominant vision for data-driven farming that sees data as raw, right, um, unpeopled, like a natural resource, right, that can be mined. I mean, I think the word, the, the phrase data mining is appropriate or um, speaks volumes about this perspective. We instead are taking the perspective that data are cooked, hence the image here. Um, they're actively shaped by people, um, even in their initial collection, who, who um, are in, operate in particular social but also technical contexts. 
So for example, it's you know a database is of someone's vision. It represents a selection of all of the data possibly available on any given topic or phenomenon. Um, and thus, databases are partial, hence my title, partial perspectives. And seeing data this way really allows them questioning who is making decisions about data and for whom, on whose behalf, you know, and with what implications. And it's those kinds of questions, I would say, that operate on the register looking at power and how power moves through data infrastructures and, and data sets and data tools, that that's really our focus <coughs> this research project. And, and our, I would say our broad aim is in this project is to describe practices of imagination um, and imagination of think, lots of things, from imagination of what constitutes agricultural success, um, a successful farm, you know, technological success, practices of imagination that get cooked, <laughs> that get um, stabilized into um, uh, or enacted within particular data forms. And so we're looking at big data form, everything from drone technology that's used, so shown here, that's used to collect large volumes of data on, say, a, a Midwestern US farm field, uh, um, corn field, to we're also looking at precision analytics or computer programs or intelligent machines that mine that data for, um, can we get the farm forward kind of thing? That mine that forward. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, that's okay. I recognize it. That mine that data for insights or information. So we're looking at all of these. Um, Tracy Lorio is actually a collaborator on this project, and she she said I should use the word artifacts. I kept saying tools, um, artifact. I guess more precisely, a tool of human making, right? But she said, you know, we're looking at different art artifacts. So my collaborator at the PI on this project, my collaborator is um, Dr. Irina Kejevic, who's actually a faculty member in the School of Journalism and Communications here at Carleton. And, and there are, um, or sorry, my co-applicant, and there are several collaborators in this project. And I wanted to say, you know, I, I mentioned Irina and I because we come from a his, history of researching agricultural technologies. And so our problematic looking at how, you know, who the people are making decisions about data in the agricultural sector, and then with what implications, how those people have particular ideas about, again, agricultural success or technological success, and then with what implications for the, the future of the Canadian uh, food system, that really comes out of the history of work that Irina and I have done. So historically, I've researched genetically modified seed technologies, um, and how those technologies were resisted or are resisted by farmers and farming communities. And Irina has also looked at biotechnology and other agricultural technologies from what I would call a critical social science perspective. So really asking tough questions about, okay, who's going to benefit from these technologies as they currently exist, um, and, and who might benefit more, is <laughs> maybe a way to put it. So um, the broad mandate of our project, again, is to, to look at that. And, and I wanted to, there are various sort of parts to this project. We have a master's student actually at Carlson here, and Julie, she's in the back. And she's actually using user ethnography to look at some of the tools that seem to be are taken up by Canadian farmers currently. So um, she's going through the privacy policy for these tools and asking the kinds of questions that Rosita mentioned. You know, well, are, are there perhaps access issues? You know, when, when farmers are asked to sign up for a tool, um, are they and, and they're using a tool that, that is collecting information from their field? Do farmers then have issues in accessing this data that they're helping to generate? Um, are there privacy issues? You know, do some of these tools represent a potential privacy breach for particular farms in the Canadian agri-food sector? So those are the kinds of questions in that part of the project. Today I wanted to talk more about uh, um, a project that's a little less sort of technical or descriptive and more analytical, and it's involving re um, interviews. And it's interviews with um, designers of agricultural big data tools, uh, policymakers like statisticians who are using, um, according to a federal statistician, using volumes of data to make decisions in the agri food sector, but also farmers. I haven't interviewed any farmers yet. This project just got short funding last summer. I had a baby in January of this year. So um, the project is just in its earliest stages. But I have interviewed so far. So we're hoping to basically pull at three methodological threads. Um, to, to imagine the imagining, to imagine, to look at the imagining or explore the imagining, the production, and the use of big data in the agri-food sector in Canada. So far, I've interviewed seven participants, and they've all been either decision makers within government or industry, or um, a, a few practitioners. 
um, or you know, more technical folks, and I, I've interviewed no farmers so far. So this is really preliminary research, but I want to share a few insights that I'm gleaning from the research so far, as maybe um, scientifically irresponsible as that might be, just so I could generate some conversation, hopefully get your feedback on the process, but also these insights. So these aren't by any means um, you know, conclusions, uh, but they're hopefully the beginning of the conversation. So the first one is that what I'm finding is that the participants I've interviewed so far take a really practical, so unlike that promissory rhetoric of John Deere, um, you know, and, and, and it's, I would say, shared more widely about big data, right? The big data are gonna revolutionize decision making across various sectors, that the participants that I've interviewed take a decidedly more practical view on big data. Um, so they don't grip too tightly to this utopic vision that, that John Deere is using, at least in its commercials. I mean, admit, you know, to be fair, it's a commercial. But so, for example, one participant um, who worked for the federal government but is paired on a project with a large agribusiness, um, they, he, uh, this person said they're simply rushing to collect huge volumes of data, in this case on a particular, if I told you the plant that they're interested in, you know the corporation, so I can't, I can't tell you that, but a particular plant, they're collecting huge amounts of information on soil quality and plant quality on this particular plant, but this person doubts they will find any meaning in this data. <laughs> That's actually something the person said to me. That, you know, this mass accumulation of data in the search for unexpected, right, patterns, um, or even patterns that exceed insight is not new, right, that's, I'm not a technical person, but I'm guessing that's the backbone to a lot of precision analytics, right, we'll just collect the data and then maybe something will emerge from the data collection, but the candor of this person about, you know, this might not lead to anything, very likely won't lead to anything, I thought was really interesting. Um, similarly, an employee um, working for this same large agribusiness, the one that's paired with um, the federal government describes, it says, you know, uh, I mean, Jack, so there, I interviewed two people at, at once uh, over the phone. Um, I mean, we were, talking, we were talking about this the other day. We thought when we first got into this, wow, we'll have a revolution. <laughs> well, um, a revolution within the first year or two, right? And everybody thinks that at first, but, but um, you get humbled and, and there was a long pause. And so I, you know, I said, by the process? Yeah, by the process. So. So a lot of hope that circulated around the collection, in this case, of a large amounts of data, again, around soil quality and particular plant traits in, in order to decrease yield variability, they're calling it. Um, but then they're finding, and this person actually used the analogy of the Human Genome Project. They said, they said it's kind of like the Human Genome Project, where there was this rush, rush to code the genome, and, but then now when it comes to talking about descriptions about what genes actually might do, or talking about gene functionality, there's kind of, we're kind of at a loss. The other more interesting, I think, insight is that I'm finding that um, that you know big agricultural data are not an abstract thing. Um, you know, I was thinking about the conference theme, data power, and what makes data powerful um, and data practices particularly daunting is their seeming capability to identify patterns in the world, right? Truths that are that seem to be given by nature, right? I mean, data are powerful because presumably they can tell us interesting things. Um, but also, you know, the, the, the perception that data are on people gives them a kind of, I guess, I would say, cultural power, right, or cachet. Um, and of course, critical data scholars like those in attendance at this conference make visible that it's particular people who generate ideas about big data and therefore have it, um, a say in their implications. So what I'm presenting here is less a novel finding than, I guess, an empirically verified claim. <laughs> But what, I, but what I'm finding is that, you know, in terms of big agricultural data, and those are artifacts that I'm looking at, that they're not on people, that people are still necessary for the use of, or for the generation of insights in the agri-food sector. So in this case, um, I was chatting with, in December of 2016, I had a conversation with a statistician working with large volumes of agricultural data within the Provincial Department of Agriculture, Aquaculture, and Fisheries in New Brunswick. And this is really consequential decision making because this person was basically, is, is used when a, the government wants to move forward in a particular policy direction in terms of agriculture or aquaculture. This person was asked to provide um, the kind of, uh, uh, not cost benefit, um, the economic justification for moving in that direction. And so the participant says, you know, I think that, but the person says, you know, we're collecting large volumes of agricultural data, but, but the decisions about which data to collect actually happen at the federal level. And then this person, the data that they work with, that they come to this person processed. And that's because, um, you know, the data have to be anonymized. There's privacy issues, right, the potential to identify an individual farm, especially in a smaller region like New Brunswick, smaller province like New Brunswick. 
and so they have to be anonymized, and so the data are cleaned, anonymized, but the, nonetheless, this person said, yeah, but I can ask very detailed questions, mostly for technical reasons, of these federal statisticians. So I can ask questions, right, about, about process, so that's our back and forth here, and I say, so they don't, the data don't come to you opaque, and this person says, no, no, I can ask questions about, you know, how the data were compiled, Perhaps not maybe what data were collected in the first place, but certainly how, how the process was followed. Similarly, in 2016, I interviewed the chief analytics officer at another prominent agribusiness. And this person described how a corporation um, who are using drone imagery of particular plant fields to generate information on variability in that field in order to maximize yield, how really the drones and these um, sophisticated computer programs are all well and good, but they still almost more than historically, than before this technology was put into practice, they still rely on agronomists to, to ground truth with the language. So, so there's still, there's almost an, uh, an increased reliance on agronomic knowledge to ground truth these computer programs. Um, and that's the conversation here. So um, essentially it means that you still need to be in the field regardless of how technologically advanced we get. Obviously if you're shadow, they're talking about an expression. You know, the best thing you can have in the field is your shadow. So you still need to be in the field, they're saying to practitioners. And, and I'm finding that this corporation is still employing, um, is employing actually more agronomists in order to ground truth what the algorithms are suggesting to them, which I found really interesting. You know, because a lot of the, some of the concerns around the move toward data-driven decision making have been about the replacement, as you mentioned, of people. Right? And in farming, this is a historic issue, right? How are farmers detached from their own pra practices, alienated, right? Because of uh, technology's mediating factor. Well, I'm finding here that, I mean, I'm not sure about farmers yet, because I have interviewed farmers, but in this case, agronomists are certainly still being employed within industry and within government. I think the last insight that I'm finding, and this is, um, again, this is sort of maybe a hunch or a problematic at the beginning, but is that big data are a socio-technical actor in Canadian politics. I'm going to unpack this, but interestingly, while acknowledging the data, so it wasn't just that I'm finding that people are still, data are still people within the agri-food sector, but the participants I interviewed still, rec they obviously recognize that people are essential. They're two separate things. Um, but interestingly, the participants I interviewed couldn't seem to quite you know, prompt them, um, make space to critically reflect upon upon why certain data were being generated, right? Why certain research questions were being asked, um, why, certain, uh, why, why certain directions were being um, explored in terms of the use of data in the agri-food sector at the expense of others, right? Um, so, right, they couldn't really see, I don't think, that, that um, even though there are people making these decisions, data are processed, right, by people that are generated by people, that, that this is actually political decision-making and consequential is for, for steering the Canadian food system in particular directions. So when asked about their turn toward precision analytics, this participant at a big um, Canadian agribusiness said, oh, it was just the direction came from our CEO. And I kept trying to prop okay, but why this direction? You know, well, it's because you, you know, we're straight. And so the direction that they're they're applying big data, I said, to minimize yield variability, right? And they've got obviously a legal mandate to maximize profit as a corporation. So there's that, obviously, influencing their de deploying of this tool. But when I kept saying, you know, okay, forget about that within your corporation, but what about the food system at large? And can you see these technologies, algorithms, drone technologies uh, being put to use to, to look at other issues in the food system besides yield, maximizing yield or productivity, the, the person couldn't quite get there. I kept saying, no, yield, yield isn't the issue, which is interesting to me. Similarly, when I interviewed that um, statistician at the provincial level in New Brunswick, I asked how, so okay, um, this person said, yes, I can ask federal statisticians about how data are processed, and I said, and, and why do you think they make decisions the way they do, which this person said was according to a cost-benefit analysis. This person said, uh, it's tradition. And I kept saying, well, so can you unpack that? You know, wh where does this tradition come from? And well, they just, of course they're interested in GDP. Of course they're interested in, I'm interested in GDP. Of course at the federal uh, level they're interested in cost-benefit, but I said, you know, why? Why is that, why is that the goal? Right, that sort of defines the use in this case of big data. And, and this person couldn't say much beyond this tradition. And I have like five pages of transcripts that talk about tradition, tradition, tradition. So, um, you know, I'm, so this is super preliminary, so perhaps irresponsible of me to be drawing any conclusions at all. But I'm, I'm seeing that, you know, 
that there are dominant ideas of agricultural success that have been circulating in North America now for at least 100 years. This is from, pulled actually from a copy of National Geographic in 1972, The Revolution in American Agriculture. It's a really good excerpt. Um, and, or, or article where you know this farmer is imagined as a successful farmer and because he's more, he's described as a farmer businessman. And this was a, sort of, a, I think I would say, a first resignification of, of a farmer from away from livelihood and farming, away from livelihood to business. Um, you know, the, the, in here the computer is described as the farmer's, you know, um, the farm hand, the computer is the farm hand. This, this farmer um, farmed a huge number of hectares. Uh, the, the, it's pictured at one point in the article in a helicopter. And this was the, the vision of, um, of agricultural success, right? Which is a productivist in food studies language vision, right? Um, high maximizing yield, mostly of one crop or monocropping, largely for export production. So these are particular visions for what constitutes success in farming. And I'm not saying they're bad visions, I'm not making a normative claim, but they're particular visions, right? They're, that's a partial vision for what could constitute success in agriculture. And, and what I'm seeing so far is that these high players within industry and within the federal and provincial governments who are making use of big agricultural data share this vision, this productivist vision for agriculture. And that vision of success is getting um, cooked into, you could say, decisions about which data to collect, how to use data. Um, so, right, that's what I mean by a socio-technical phenomenon, right? Ideas of agricultural success don't sit separate from the processes of big data. These are favored meanings of success in agriculture that are now long-standing um, in the North American food system. And as such, big data are an interesting socio-technical phenomenon. They enter into a broader food politics network, right? Not everyone shares this vision of success. Um, and so, interestingly, I, I'm, I'm really curious to know what activists in the food politics community and farmers are doing, if, if they share these visions of success, um, maybe farmers might constitute a modality of resistance to these dominant um, visions for big agricultural data, maybe not. Just to, um, as a final word, I, I, I truly believe that now is the time, um, this morning Michael told me that precision analytics has existed within agriculture, how long did you say? Since the 90s. This is fairly new in terms of an area of, of academic focus on finding big agricultural data. I think that's supported by the literature. There's not many people looking at this. Um, but even since the 90s, you know, in terms of agricultural technologies, that's like, re relatively new. But unlike the technology, I would say that like biotechnology, where the infrastructures, like the legal infrastructure, was really um, firmed up and with very particular implications for farmers and for agribusiness. You know, it seems to me that big data is still kind of an open regulatory arena. It, or there's still some openness. So I think now is the time for focus to ask questions like, how are these tools going to be used? For whom? For whose benefit? Right? Because I think there is power um, for positive. Uh, um, there's potential in, in the use of big data. But we have to ask those kinds of questions and help to inform regulatory oversight on the uses of, of these artifacts, not tools, in order to maximize um, their potential for a wide variety of players in the agri food sector. Thanks. Michael? All right. All right. Thanks everyone for coming. I know there's a lot of great sessions going on, and more importantly, it's beautiful outside, so <laughs> you could be doing other things than this. So um, what I wanted to talk about, I've been studying issues of food and agriculture since the late 1990s while a graduate student at Iowa State University. And I've been kind of looking at it through lots of lenses, one of which being a science and technology studies lens too. And I've been looking at issues of big data and precision agriculture for a few years now. And I want to just tell you about one particular project that's a um, multi-year project that involves lots of data. Um, and uh, big data, I guess, in some way, but big qualitative data. Um, and just tell you a little bit about what, what it is I'm finding and kind of talk through it a little bit. And it kind of builds nicely upon what people have been talking about, what our two panelists have been talking about already. So, um, you know, in, in the, in it, what I find interesting about precision agriculture is that, as Kelly mentioned, it isn't something that's really been impacted all that much by social scientists. It's been around for decades. I remember people talking about it in the 90s. It could go back before that even. And friends that I know that are in that space as engineers and technicians um, have, have kind of dominated it. And there's not much space for at least the social sciences to have a conversation. So I'm going to talk about um, some of these other questions 
social, political, and even to some degree, philosophical questions that are being asked by this um, technology. So a little bit about the landscape, and this is um, nothing new for all of you, I'm sure. Um, basically what the slide says is that um, precision ag is, is the next big thing. Um, in most of the West, and increasingly in non-Western countries as well. Um, the most recent data for the U.S. is only as recent as uh, 2010. I expect some new figures to come out in a few years, but there's already three, uh, three-fourths of all farmers um, that are cultivating that report using precision egg technologies. A similar number in the, number in the Netherlands, and you can find similar other, uh, numbers in Australia and New Zealand. New Zealand. In other parts of Europe, um, it was already mentioned, Kelly mentioned it um, as well, about Monsanto's acquisition of Climate Corporation for almost a billion dollars. Um, Monsanto seems to be able to look over the horizon and see what is the next big thing, or maybe to some degree a self-fulfilling prophecy, they're making the next big thing because of their investments. Um, but the amount of data that they're able to generate because of that is quite tremendous here. You can see I read a, a report where they're able to generate about seven gigs of data per acre, perhaps it's even more than that with updates now. But with over a million acres of farmland in the United States alone, um, that's an awful lot of data that they're able to generate, and you recognize that about 75% of all farmers, and the number's probably over 80% now, because those numbers um, were seven years ago. A little bit more of the landscape that was touched upon earlier, too. Um, there's some unease, understandably, one over what's sometimes referred to as the data divide. This is from a uh, Farm Bureau survey in 2015. The U.S. Um, Farm Bureau is probably the largest lobbying organization in the United States, relatively conservative, but very well respected, and they tend to have very high survey rates when it comes to surveying conventional growers. And this just quote from the survey, 77.5% of farmers surveyed said they feared regulators of other government officials might gain access to the private information. There were only 76% of respondents said they were concerned others could use their information uh, for market speculation without their consent. And while 81% said they believe they still retain ownership of their data, 82% said they actually have no idea um, <laughs> if they do or not what companies do with it. So. Something else that kind of interests me more personally with some of my research is I'm really interested from an IP standpoint because before looking at big data precision agriculture, I looked at biotechnology and intellectual property rights as it pertains to biotechnology. And so in the US, we have what's called the US Digital Millennium Copyright Act it goes back to 1998, and it essentially prevents digital piracy. It makes it illegal to, to crack in and tinker with your iPhone or your tractors or computer brains or other things like that. Um, recently, in 2015, there was, a, there was a push to try to loosen that up and make some excep exceptions. And during that process, John Deere infamously sent a letter um, to the US Copyright Office arguing that farmers receive an implied lease um, for the life of the vehicle to operate the vehicle, referring to the tractor. What's interesting, it's a really interesting parallel between arguments that were made about 10 or 20 years ago now in the context of biotechnology and seed. The argument was, and still is, that farmers don't actually own the seed. Um, they're, they're just essentially leasing the technology, and therefore they can't save it. Um, they can't reuse it. They can't do what they want with it. And it's curious how a similar argument is being made um, in, when it comes to smart technology. Now, interestingly enough, the Library of Congress ruled in favor of the exception and, and, and allowed, has allowed tinkering to occur, but I know when this first happened, magazines such as Ford and Wired and others were celebrating this as, the, as a way of allowing anybody to do whatever they want. But there's, when you dig down into the, um, into the exception, it's, it's much more gray. First of all, I, I like using the word tinkering. It's not exactly clear what farmers can do if they even have the knowledge to tinker with their, um, with their tractor. So that point's a little fuzzy as well. Just what can they do? They can't actually go in and completely rewrite the code, but they can tinker with it. I like that term. It's never really been described to me what they can re legally be allowed to do and where that line in the legal sand is. And the other really interesting point about that is that it's only the farmer, the person who's purchased the equipment that can do this tinkering. And most farmers, at least that I know, most don't have this sort of technological expertise, which is in and of itself sort of interesting because farmers are arguably the first do-it-yourself selfers, and they've been doing it since time immemorial. Um, but they don't really have the technological expertise 
and they, they're not legally allowed to let anybody else do it because once you bring another third party in, you're crossing a legal line in the sand. So while it was celebrated when I first came on, there's a realization that it doesn't really amount to much. And there's an interesting movement that I'm starting to study in the United States too called the Right to Repair Movement. And so there's, there's initiatives throughout the states. My neighboring state of Nebraska looked like it might be the first state to allow this legislation to pass, but about a month ago it, it died in the committee and was never voted on. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be talking to some folks when I get back to the states that are associated closely with this Right to Repair Movement. But there is this movement to try to expand this exception because what they're also trying to do with the movement is to make it make a diagnostic equipment available to people other than certified providers too, because that's another issue that I'm learning is that this diagnostic equipment is only provided to um, licensed, for example, John Deere mechanics. Um, and if you do get your hands on this diagnostic equipment, you have to sign user agreements, and we all know, you know, the the, the fine print of those user agreements. It, is, it essentially turns you into a, a John Deere mechanic in a way. So, um, so there's that interesting movement that's happening in the states too around these issues of ownership. So I'm going to take a slightly different approach with, with this talk, and I'm going to not talk about the legal questions or even to some degree the ethical questions about who ought to own it, but I'm going to be discussing something um, that might sound a little bit more profound, um, but it will make sense once I show you some data. And the question is, what role do these technologies have in shaping our understanding of food futures in terms of what is and what ought to be? And in some ways, this, this draws directly upon or stands directly upon what Kelly was talking about, too, where she talked about things like visions of success, practices of imagination. You know, what do these technologies and these practices and these assemblages, how do they shape how we think about food and how we think about the future and what we think is and what ought to be? All right, so to make sense of this, I'm going to, um, I use this term keywords. This is written by kind of an eclectic gentleman, Raymond Williams, who is a literary critic, not a social scientist and, and um, may not seem like somebody that a social scientist can draw from, but I promise you, I think this will make sense when again I show you some data. But what he argues with regard to keywords, and it kind of plays upon what was discussed this morning when we were talking about, um, in the open forum, about um, uh, big data sovereignty in the context of indigenous nations. He said, how words make worlds. And I think Williams would say, absolutely. Williams' point is that, like, like eyes are to the soul, William, our words are a portal in the, into the various assumptions we hold about the world um, in terms of what it, what it ought to be and what it looks like. And his point is, is that we, we have similar, we might use the same term, the same key word, you know, whether it's big data or sustainability is a big word, or even a bigger word is nature. But we mean very different things when you start drilling down and examining those keywords. So I'm going to be looking at two keywords specifically. Did I mention those? All right, so the data I'm going to be drawn from are actually, kind of, are actually three studies I'm going to be weaving together in the remaining few minutes. One um, involves 25 um, large-scale commodity producers in Iowa and Illinois who employ precision egg technology to make farm management decisions. Um, the other study is 20 employees, sales reps, technicians, engineers largely who make these um, technological artifacts. Um, from various big data companies in North America and the UK, and 18 farmers from the around the US that are associated relatively loosely, because FarmHack is a relatively loose organization, not like AARP or CR Club or something like that, um, who are organized with this group called FarmHack. And if you're interested in FarmHack, this is just a website. You know, I'm not interested particularly with this talk in farm hack as a social movement, but I'm just kind of interested in, interested in how they think about things like code and digital technologies and software platforms for enacting certain futures or you know, these visions that look a lot different from the John Deere vision that we were shown a half hour ago. So in all, I'm talking about a, a roughly 100 face-to-face -face interviews, um, lots of participant observations, um, I spent a lot of time on farmers' farms, engaging with their technology, watching them. When I was with the engineers, they would show me what they were doing and talk about it. Um, and same with the farm hack organization. And then they also use a word cloud instrument, which is kind of an interesting way of presenting big data. And this is where that keyword analysis comes in. 
And so one of the things I did while I was interviewing all these people is I asked them, actually I, I unpacked a number of keywords, but the two I'm going to be looking at here are the keyword of food security and the keyword of precision agriculture. And I asked them, select three terms describing what food security means to you, and then select three terms describing what precision agriculture means to you. And then before they answered, I also gave them a list of 50 different terms um, that they could choose from um, so that it created some internal validity um, with regard to this process and made the data a little bit more manageable. And this list itself was constructed from the large amounts of past research that I've done talking to farmers and talking to eaters and talking to people in food industry um, too. And then I took it and I plugged it into word cloud generating software. And so, um, so this is the, the image, and I, and I didn't include, it had to be, the, the term had to be mentioned, I think, two or three times um, to be included in this, just to create images that were more readable. But it's really interesting, the type of, the, the images that were created, and the words that were used, to <coughs> think about, in this case, the keyword being food security. And I think it speaks directly to like Kelly's point about how these technological artifacts are based on different visions, but also to some degree, I don't have time to get in it, but I would also argue that these technologies and the practices they encourage and nurture them, themselves help feed and shape our understanding of these keywords too. So I see it being very iterative. And so here's the farm hat group, and they were asked about food security, the, the terms that were mentioned, conventional farmers, um, and then big, what I just call big data execs. If there's any big data folks in here, my apologies if the term is improper. <laughs> um, and it, you know, it's interesting, Kelly's point mentioning it with yields and, and how that, I mean, some of this kind of reiterates some of the points and emphasizes certain points that Kelly made too. But we're going to different farm communities. So. We are, yes, yeah. But maybe from, yeah, from different farm community, but similar assemblages and practices and other things like that. And then so moving on to the other key keyword, precision agriculture. Give you all plenty of time to pack this again. Now, I met, you know, when I was interviewing all of these folks, it was under the, the pretense of, you know, talking about precision agriculture and data. So they were clearly primed to talk about some of these things, too. I'm not, I don't deny that. But they were all primed for it as well. And so I think that mitigates, even though they were, they were coaxed to talk, want to talk about and say things like data sharing, um, they were all coaxed. So I think that might, you know, kind of even it out a bit. And, and yet, still, the responses were quite different. And interesting, you know, farmers were to some degree ambivalent here when it comes to precision ag. You know, they see the benefits, they may they talk about profit maximization, but then also like, the term anxiety is still there too. So there's some clear ambivalence, more ambivalence maybe than you might see with the big data execs. And then just a completely different understanding for those associated with farm hack. I guess I should say, since it, it looks like I'm gonna have plenty of time, you know, you might see similar words appearing like Internet of Things here with Farm Hack and Internet of Things with Big Data Execs. And I don't have time to get into this, but this is where the qualitative interviews come in. And, and, and so, you know, even though they use the same term, and in some degree they were drawing from a list of, a, of terms, but they were drawing from the same list that had the terms defined, when you start unpacking them more to the qualitative interviews, their understanding of that term, Internet of Things, was quite, quite different. It was a more, you know, in the case of Farm Pack, it was a much more open understanding of the Internet of Things where they were sharing and collaboration, and there wasn't that type of discussion with big data execs. How much time do I have? I think I have like four slides or five. <laughs> All right, perfect, great. Um, well, I still only really have time to be mostly provocative by showing all that interesting data. Um, but what I'm talking about, this kind of links back to my, my title slide, which I guess I didn't even show you. Uh, but the title of this talk is something like Big Data and Weak Data. And what got me thinking about the term weak data, we often think of the opposite of big data as being small data. Um, 
But I would argue another way of thinking about that is that the opposite of big data might actually be weak data. I'm, I'm talking about it in the context of kind of drawing inspiration from social theory. So in social theory, we talk about, some people talk about uh, uh, strong theory, and strong theory is just kind of these, these monolithic narratives about how the world is all kind of wrapped up in, you know, whether it's, I'm not, I don't want to even say because there might be some strong theorist out there and I might offend them, but, you know, it's this idea that the world can all be explained by one large theory, and, it, and you, when you come to an empirical case with one of these strong theories, you tend to find what you're looking for. You know, it's, it's, um, it, it has a particular vision, again, or an imagination. It evokes a specific imagination about how the world is and how it is or should be or ought to be. But weak theory is more contextual. It's more, I guess you might even just say, grounded up or iterative or inductive. Um, and it's, and it's based, built upon context and talking to people. And I kind of see a similar parallel when I, when, I, when I interview folks out there, whether they're associated with big data precision agriculture that's attached to conventional ag and met, at firms like Monsanto and John Deere, and then you have this weak data. Um, so the weak data is more context specific versus big data, which is more universal. It has vi clear visions about the future, like John Deere's clear vision. Um, let me just show you a, just a little bit. One example of some qualitative um, data that I'm talking about. So this is an individual from FarmHack, but the way he talks about big data, and, and FarmHack, though, the, the people that I've talked to don't really use the term big data, and I explore more why that is, um, but that's because for them, big data means like Monsanto big data. Uh, Monsanto's big data, John Deere's, or even the government's isn't value free. These platforms presuppose and thus promote large scale capital intensive farms and um, you know, look at the micro data feeds that give predictive analytics their power. They're all fed on from sensors from large, heavy, state-of-the-art tractors, equipment. Someone farming a thousand acres really owning these, right? It's not there's not there's not a space for polyculture or small-scale organic um, agriculture in that in that image of John Deere's vision of the future. It's a very specific vision of how the world is and how it ought to be and how we ought to feed people and what food security mean means. And there's there's clear winners in that world, but then there's people that are not even in that space at all. Um, perhaps peasant agriculture or something like that. Whereas, oops, you know, weak data um, is more open and even more indeterminate. Um, if you were to ask a farm hack individual perhaps what their idea of what food security is, I mean, you saw the term food sovereignty mentioned. There is, there's openness, there's debate about what the future ought to look like. And perhaps one nice representative quote of this, again from a farm hack individual, um, you know, the value of these systems lies in the fact that they're amenable. Um, big and small versus catering exclusive to the needs of investors or stockholders shareholders and quarterly returns, etc. Um, and so it's just something I'm kind of playing with this idea. We talk a lot about big data and trying to think about it through the lens of what the opposite might be for those that are trying to create data that's more, um, well, I guess, drawn from something that was discussed this morning, more contextual, more built um, from the ground up, and more open to different interpretations and visions about, about the world. So back to that original question that I proposed, you know, what role do these technologies have in shaping our understanding of futures? Um, you know, how we engage with these technologies, first of all, reflect our understanding of keywords. This gets to the point I made earlier. Um, you know, undoubtedly, we enter into these technological arrangements in part because we hold certain understandings of keywords. But I also believe firmly, and my data kind of support this too, that these technologies and these arrangements and these engagements also shape um, our understanding of food futures too. So I, I, I see big data and precision agriculture and engagement with these platforms as being really important because it not only is going to shape what we eat, I would argue, but it also plays a role in shaping our very understanding of whether it's food, but also our understanding of what democracy might look like or civility or politics and who's included in the process. I think it it has fairly significant ramifications beyond just questions of what we're eating and what nutrition we're taking in. Um, so, I'll end there.